Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, we're made in Gruppe Bitnik. Uh, this is Doma. My name is Carmen. We're really happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, and we'd like to show you a series of works. We don't quite know how many. We've been kind of um, changing the slides, so we'll have to see <laughs> what fits. Um, I think um, just two words about Mediengruppe Bitnik. We're from uh, Zurich originally. We're based in Berlin um, now, have been based for one and a half years. And we work on the digital, but usually our works also affect physical spaces, as you'll see in a minute. And uh, we'd like to talk about recent works around bots, uh, remote code, glitch. Yeah? So the first work is uh, called Random Darknet Chopper. Uh, we produced this work in 2014 together with Kunsthalle St. Gallen. Um, this was after the Snowden revelations in 2013, where we kind of felt that as artists we needed to reassess our cultural heimat, the internet, um, you know, as a kind of it was this uh, mass surveillance thing and we kind of felt we couldn't work there anymore or that many of our works were too naive. And uh, so together with Kunsthalle St. Gallen, which is an, an art space in Switzerland, uh, we put together a show around Darknet because we felt that by looking at internet subculture, we could uh, kind of question ideas around anonymity, um, intimacy, identity, identity um, yeah, trust. And um, in this show, we had 12 works by various artists uh, around these topics. And our work was Random Darknet Chopper. Basically, the random darkness chopper is a, is a piece of software, is a small bot, um, which we started in autumn 2014. Um, we started with the interest in the question of trust. How do you gain trust in encrypted networks where you don't know to whom you're speaking to? How does those trust mechanism work when everything is kind of obfuscated and, 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 and encrypted? And we wanted to challenge this question basically uh, on, on the darknet markets, which were just like um, a kind of a big topic, a controversial topic after the Silk Road uh, raid. And uh, we thought that it might be good to evaluate these questions with a bot, um, um, qu questioning also how does like trust building work when you have goods which are shipped from all over the world um, to the buyers. And so we wrote this bot, which was called the Random Darknet Chopper, which had a um, hundred US dollar weekly budget uh, um, based in bitcoins. And the idea was that the bot would log in into the deep webs and go to the biggest darknet market at that time. It was called Agora, I think. And um, randomly select an item and then buy it and directly send it to the exhibition space without our kind of interference. So the idea was that in the exhibition we had like 12 of those vitrines, they were empty, basically waited to be filled over the 12 weeks of the duration of the exhibition. So we basically connected um, the, like, the very dark markets of the dark net with the very visible uh, space of the, the art gallery. Mm. Um, technically it was pretty simple, it was basically a, a small Python script which um, 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 remote controlled uh, uh, Firefox and basically logged in uh, to the darknet markets through Tor 
and then just like uh, click around, choo uh, choose like a random category, get all the items below a hundred US dollar, um, randomly choose one, uh, hit the buy button, send an encrypted message to the seller uh, to send it directly to the exhibition space and pay the fee or the things in, uh, in Bitcoins. So um, over time, um, we wanted to have a whole landscape of goods from the dark net. There was also a lot of talk in the media at the time, while well, there still is, about you know, the dark nets and what you can buy there. And we kind of didn't believe you know, what they were telling us. We really wanted to see what we would like randomly, like a random selection, what we would randomly get <coughs> from the dark nets. And the first item was um, called Fire Brigade Master Key Set, um, which the seller said was a set of keys um, usually owned by the Fire Brigade in the UK to open storage. Um, Pu public gates in public spaces, uh, stuff they need access to. So we, we have no idea whether it's true or not. But it's, I, st I still really like that object because it has that potential of, you know, opening doors in the UK. Uh, the second item was uh, cigarettes from the Ukraine. Um, so basically, you know, in, in very uh, good darknet fashion, uh, circumventing the taxation on tobacco in the European Union. Um, yeah. I think it was about 35 US dollars uh, yeah. at that time. Um, uh, third week, we had like this Louis Vuitton Trevi handbag for 95 US dollars. And actually, uh, if we speak about trust, this was the only items, item which wasn't delivered. But the seller was kind enough to send the bitcoins back because he knew like he couldn't deliver. So also here, it kind of worked. Then we received um, uh, the Lord of the Rings collection by J.R.R. Tolkien in PDF format, which for one dollar, which we printed. Yeah, it's like several thousand pages. Then um, the first, like, uh, or no, the second, like, super digital item. Um, um, it was called the Visa. Visa Platinum top card sent from Torland for $35. Um, apparently, this was a Visa prepaid. No, uh, yeah, we received a, a Visa, so the Visa number, the uh, expiry date, the name, and the little number you have on the back. Yeah, and we didn't dare to use it. Then, uh, sixth week, uh, the random darknet chopper selected uh, 10 yellow ecstasy pills with a Twitter logo um, on them, uh, sent from Germany for $48 to Switzerland. They actually arrived. Um, we took them as a title for the talk also because we really like the description. Um, yeah, we yeah, displayed them like yeah, the rest. They came uh, like in this stealth packaging, uh, you know, k kind of pretending to be a DVD in this alu foil and then vacuumed again. Yes, and um, around about this time, um, also the press started picking up on, on the work because um, they kind of felt that this random darknet chopper was questioning or posing questions around, you know, who's responsible if a bot commits something illegal. Um, so, um, what happens when a software bot goes on a darknet shopping spree? Uh, the Guardian asked, um, you know, who is, who is responsible when a bot ram randomly shops for ecstasy in the darknet? Is it the person that who programmed it? Is it the person who executes it? Can a robot or a piece of software be jailed if it commits a crime? And also what happens if the code is open source and uh, written by many people? Like if you have like an algorithm which goes wild. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
But the random darknet chopper just continued chopping, and it uh, bought some Nike Air GC2 uh, limited edition trainers uh, for seventy-five dollars. Mm -hmm. um, if you convert like the bitcoins into nowadays value, it would be around three thousand US dollar. Um, yeah, uh, it cost it seventy-five dollars at the time. Then we received a cap with a built-in camera. Um, that little, yeah, that's where the camera is. Uh, from the US for mm. 99 US dollars. Mm -hmm. Then a thing I really liked, it's called like the decoy first class letter. So it's basically a plain letter you receive, like a service. And it came from Australia, um, addressed to like our exhibition space uh, in Switzerland. Um, it's basically an empty letter, just like to basically trace through your postal, to trace through the postal system to check if the system is okay, if you can receive mails, if it's, you know, maybe somebody opens it. So the idea like by, you know, buying stuff in the deep webs is basically also to anonymize somehow your postal, uh, your postal box. And to test that, you can basically, you know, send yourself a letter and see if something happens. It's also good tactics to basically, if you want to introduce a new address somewhere, you know, start sending letters there. And uh, the post office, the post, m m like the post person, the delivery person will kind of, you know, get used to it and basically, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the next item was a Sprite stash can. Um, you probably know this. This is a soda can, an empty soda can, um, constructed to weigh the same as a, as a full one, and you can screw the top on. So you can place whatever you want inside, and it's hidden away. Then the next one, uh, diesel man jeans, a replica from Hong Kong for 79 US dollar. And the last item we received was a um, high quality scan of a Hungar Hungarian passport uh, for uh, online verification. Um, so here you see this is basically how we displayed the items. Um, and uh, this all went really well until we took down the exhibition in January 2015 and the day after the exhibition closed, the public prosecutor of St. Gallen in Switzerland um, basically seized the whole work and um, we, we were a bit confused. Uh, this was, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so we were a bit confused in the first moment be because of the timing. So after the exhibition closed, they ceased the whole work. And, um, but it kind of turned out that they were, um, for them it was mostly about the drugs the random darknet shopper had bought. Uh, we were kind of worried about the passport and the visa card as well, <laughs> uh, which they felt was totally okay yeah. and, and then like in the and in the first moment I mean like you know the question also by the public prosecutor was raised I mean like it was about responsibility who is responsible in this specific moment is it the artist who wrote the codes is it the museum who basically hosts the show is it the curator is it the people who work there because I mean like me and Carmen we've never touched those drugs we have not Basically, you know, it's, it was all done somehow automatically. Or, um, yeah, is it, is it the bot himself who is somehow um, its own legal entity and could be punished? So, in order to somehow also protect the staff of the museum and to also, you know, uh, to get our items back, we thought, I mean, like, this stuff is ours, we want the things back. We raised our hands and said, no, I'm mean, like, I think if you should. If you want to charge somebody, you should charge us. 
and uh, we were summoned for an interrogation, uh, which was really interesting. Um, there we learned that the drugs actually contained MDMA, uh, so the police had tested them and confirmed that they uh, did. I mean, like we knew through the ratings <laughs> on the drugs, <laughs> on the darknet markets, that I mean, like this stuff was good. But then we, um, we kind of had to discuss, you know, um, or we kind of tried to explain what we were, that we were trying to raise these questions in public through public, you know, publicly accessible art piece uh, because we felt it very important that we talk about these things. Um, nevertheless, uh, the public prosecutor decided to destroy the drugs, um, which was very unfortunate. We, of course, claimed they were an art piece. So you're destroying an art piece here? And our lawyer was also kind of, you know, referencing all other artworks which involve drugs, like yeah. from like the whole history. Yeah. Um, but we did receive the whole work back in the end, except for the drugs, and uh, all charges were dropped against us um, and the public prosecutor um, wrote a very nice um, letter saying that we actually were allowed to break certain laws to raise certain questions within society without naming specifically naming freedom of art. Yeah. So basically our understanding of why they kind of seize the whole thing is what that they were kind of afraid what the next artist would do. So the first one, you know, buys it, the second one takes it as a performative act, and the third one gives it to the audience, you know, and it's kind of clear that they need to um, draw a line. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. So the, so the question about responsibility was not kind of solved. No, we Here. still have, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we kind of then continued with um, this question of um, bots and the mechanical gaze. Oh, yeah, that's okay, you're jumping, sorry. Yeah. Wrong introduction. <laughs> um, no, uh, well, similar, no. Um, a year later, no, the same year, we were asked to um, do a public art piece, uh, which is always the case in Switzerland when uh, public buildings are built, uh, part of the, the money has to go into an art piece. And usually that art piece is sculptural. Um, it can be a sculpture in the lobby or... A sculpture in public space. Uh, it should, there's like d different kind of... Uh, things you need to address. Um, there's, I mean, like the public art piece should work for 30 years, should be sustainable. So it's mostly made out of stone. Yeah. So for us as digital artists, um, this was a very uh, kind of an interesting question. Um, also because the building was or is the house for electronic arts in Basel, also Switzerland. So for us, the question was, how, how can we talk about digital? Um, topics, but not using digital media. Mm -hmm. And and we ask ourselves: Is there kind of is there a way of? I mean, like we we thought a lot about architecture and software and how basically the software you use is also in, in infecting or yes. the architecture which is built. And and since this is all software, but what we have never seen is basically a software error kind of, you know, um, so we ask ourselves, is it possible to build or is it funny to build like a software error into stone? And um, we, we kind of had to try that. Yeah, we, we had to try that. So, so we <laughs> took a picture of, of the place of this house and, and basically glitched it um, through a small script and told them to rebuild it. And uh, yeah, this so is how it looks now. This is what the building looks like today. Um, so basically, they, yeah, you can see it. They, um, <laughs> and it. 
kind of, it kind of, um, when you stand there, it kind of gives you a surreal feeling to, there's a, like a square in front of this facade and you, you're kind of not sure whether, you know, your eyes are wrong or the building is wrong. And then you, when you come closer, you then of course see. And, and also like, built. you know, also here, like the glitch reveals stuff. Like, you know, people came to us and asked, I mean, like, how, how does the piping system work? You know, I mean, like, is it still is it still here? And this is something you know which we like about software glitches that you kind of sometimes you 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 get an understanding how system works only by kind of breaking it or by forcing it to to throw errors. And uh, yeah. Um. Then we. Sorry. Yeah, we need to discuss what we're <laughs> speaking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. So we'll skip another project because Sorry. we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think the last piece we'd like to just quickly uh, show you is very recent. We we're still not. I, I, yeah. We still. We're still kind of amazed at this. So this year we were asked to um, do a book on our work and we kind of um, felt um, th this was really difficult for us because usually we do websites and you can change websites and then you do a book and you kind of, it's printed and then it's there and that really, it, it was very, um, very kind of hard for us, but once we decided to do this, we kept thinking about how can we break this very static print format of the book. And together with the two designers of the book, uh, Konrad Renner and Christoph Knott, um, we thought about, you know, we, we said, well, the title should be code, because maybe through the title, you could kind of inject code into various websites because books, you know, they're online, you can buy them online. And we decided um, to go for script alert, Mediengruppe Bitnik yeah, which script. Is, yeah, just like a stupid as a title. JavaScript, basically, <laughs> which normally, like you, you, I mean, like, you can't write JavaScript into a commentary field on Facebook because this thing is parsed out. And so the browser does not execute that code, so they check it. But we thought maybe, I mean, like, if it's so deep in the databases, like the ISBN databases, the national bi bibliographies, and whatever, you know, it might uh, pop up somewhere. And uh, yeah. so the. <laughs> and well, the book came out in September, and then in October we realized that on uh, Walter Koenig, which is a big art um, book, book seller with a big online um, website, um, it worked. So when you search for Middengruppe Bitnik on the website, hope this works, and you go to the catalog, you get that. So, this one, this one is pretty okay. I mean, like, uh, normally if you, on other website it breaks the buy button, which is like, yeah. not in our interest, but, <laughs> hey, yeah. So, yeah, you can still buy it on Buchhandlung Walter König. Just like click OK and then it's OK. So, yeah, here's just like a small collection of like uh, 10, 12, which are popping up. It's uh, like every day we get more. And yeah, and we can show you a small video like of two, two three pieces. Yeah. Um, don't know what we're going to see now. I think eBay. Oh, they're gone. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is eBay. 
So eBay.co.uk. Bam. And this only worked on, on, or they already fixed it, so somebody made a bug report. I like this one. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. There are already people lined out. Yeah, please. Number two. Uh, very cool talk, thanks. Um, I'm from Switzerland, so I wonder, you were lucky that you got dropped with the charges. How much would you got for the charges if you would not drop them? Do you know? I, I, I don't know. I mean, like, it was basically, or here it was about drug possession, and I mean, like, 10 ecstasy pills, and we were totally okay to take this fine. Uh, we, we don't know, know, know it, but it was kind of... It would have been a fine because in Switzerland, according to our lawyer, it would have been um, for personal use. I mean, this is not <laughs> the amount you carry around apparently if you're selling. So we would have gotten away with a fine. So, and I, um, thanks very much that you said that actually writing the code and then the program buys it, makes you actually responsible, right? So, would you, also you, at the end you said, like, it was your, um, also I would take the charge because you were writing the code, yes. so... Yeah, the problem was that usually, um, at, at least in Swiss law, possession of drugs needs to mean that the drugs were either found on your person or in a space that can be, um, you know, that definitely belongs to you. And the problem um. was that it was clear from the process that we hadn't touched the drugs. And we didn't want somebody else to get fined for drug possession. That would have made no sense. We wanted to also publicly discuss this, you know, this having to, um, yeah step up and say, no, it was us. Thanks. Okay, final one. Hi, sorry, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I have to ask, does the plumbing work? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <thanks. laughs> um, it works because, so the pillars were, uh, well, yeah, I'll try to explain briefly. So, uh, architecturally, this building was, um, a storage for dry goods and the pillars used to support the building but when they turned it into a museum they actually filled the space um, between the pillars with insulation so the pillars were gone and then the architects didn't like it like you know they thought the pillars should be there because the building didn't look good so they actually put fake pillars onto the facade again and so we could just kind of take the empty pillars and cut them up and put the plumbing inside so now the visible plumbing is fake but the real plumbing is inside the pillars yeah. that's how it works yeah. As, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing work, one. yeah one final big round of applause for me thank you. Bitnik, and thanks. thanks for being here thank you